we have a four amazing presentations for you today. Uh, I'm Zlatina, I'm the moderator of this uh, series. And without uh, further ado, can we please join um, Philip O'Neill, who is joining us um, from the University of Ulster, and his project is titled Designing New Worlds. So, Philip, if you can please join me on stage. Fantastic. And the stage is yours. Okay. Um, okay, so welcome to my presentation today, uh, Design of New Worlds, Design, Evaluation and Specification of User Experiences with an Immersive Environment. So a little bit of context about the project. Um, there's obviously been a renewed interest in virtual reality at the moment. Um, however, it has uh, some uh, technical, behavioral and sensual design problems that also exist. Um, there has been a VR, AR working group established um, to set new standards. However, uh, these are not hardware standards and may lead to confusion in the future of open standards. So user experience or UX is seen as a way that could fix, potentially fix some of these issues. So when I started uh, my PhD, I was very surprised to find out how one of the oldest forms of communication, storytelling, was so vital to one of the newest forms of communication. However, um, as I did my literature review, um, I realized that a lot of uh, attention was focused on 360 video uh, which only allows for rotational motion or three degrees of freedom, whereas full VR allows for both uh, rotational and translational uh, motion, uh, moving forward, backward, laterally or vertically, um, as VR is, after all, a, a spatial storytelling uh, space. Um, a good example of uh, six degrees of freedom uh, experience would be the Vader Immortal series. Um, and the CEO of Industrial Light Magic uh, Labs, uh, who produced this series, Becky Dobbs Beck, has stated that this is a new form of storytelling, not film or gaming, but what we call story living. So my research question then became how to best use storytelling as a tool to enhance UX in immersive environments. And I love this quote from Ursula Le Guin. There have been great societies that did not use the wheel, but there have been no societies that did not tell stories. And the story that I have to tell um, is about uh, this lady, Takabuti, a 25th uh, dynasty high status lady from ancient Karnak in Egypt. Um, it's a joint uh, project with the National Museum of Northern Ireland and Ulster University. And when I saw Takabuti in the museum, as you see in this photograph, um, I didn't want to recreate what the museum already had, which was mainly Takabuti in her uh, coffin. But in VR, to be able to walk in places that she would have walked during her life and to try to recreate what it would have been like when she was alive. So to that end, um, to date, what I have created is uh, three of four virtual environments, um, a Takabuti uh, Museum exhibition, which helps place Takabuti's timeline and context with ancient Egypt, giving some uh, backstory to her life. Um, she lived at quite a turbulent time in ancient Egypt. Um, and in this exhibit, then you can take uh, three portals, uh, one to a reconstruction of part of Karnak Temple, where her father was a priest, and one to an upper class home estate of the time. These all explore storytelling from the perspective of the environment, a storyteller, i.e. the museum is modern with uh, interactive interfaces and audio, etc. However, the goal with the historical environments is to follow the, the uh, rule of thumb that the best interface is no interface, if, if we can, if possible, do that. So that the information that will be gathered will be by encountering historical characters and from uh, the environment itself. As I feel this gives a really unique contrast from the modern uh, museum exhibit and the feel of traveling back in time. Now, the fourth environment about the afterlife, um, I have fully scripted uh, an experience, a VR experience, uh, which would involve animation, etc. But I, I, I want to hold off um, fully creating it until I've continued uh, uh, two other studies that will help um, me build this experience with best practice for UX. 
So if I take you on a, a walkthrough of, of uh, the video right now, um, so we start outside the Takabuti exhibit. Um, the environment is built as a modern museum, much lar larger than the real life Takabuti exhibit. There are interactive areas and key objects that will help tell the backstory of Takabuti. Um, there's an interactive uh, timeline uh, that places uh, Takabuti in the context of, of where she was. There's also a two-story map of ancient Egypt, which has an inter interactive zones that uh, fill in what was going on during her life. Um, for example, uh, the Kingdom of Kush is very important in this story in that it had installed its own pharaohs in Egypt and would later cause the Assyrians to invade from the north. Um, now we move on to uh, the, the portals and the interactive content. So this is an example of uh, an interactive panel which um, was taken from a tomb of a scribe in ancient Egypt, which shows uh, musicians and dancing girls. So we, we hope that that's what his afterlife was going to be like. Um, we go to the Karnak portal, and you can see here marked in red the portion of Karnak temple uh, that I've recreated. And we go to the afterlife uh, part, uh, which is still being built. As I say, it's scripted, uh, but I need to do those further st studies. So now we're going to enter the, the home environment. So we'll go through the life portal. And we arrive at an upper class estate in ancient Egypt by the River Nile. And I've picked a specific time of day to light this golden hour, as the drama helps with the environment. There are a number of uh, affordances here, such as pathways and, and doors that open. And when you see this crash test dummy, uh, we hope to have metahumans there addressed historically that would give further information. Uh, each of these estates would have its own family shrine uh, dedica dedicated to the family gods that they would have worshipped. And they were also working estates in that they had farm elements usually kept at the back with the servants. Um, so they would have horses and cattle and, and donkeys, etc. Uh, but that was always kept at the, at the back of the estate, out of the way of visitors, etc. Um, as all of the posh stuff, such as the, uh, they had pools, etc., were all there to impress. Um, they had some modern features in these buildings, um, such as an early form of air conditioning with these vents. And on the nights when it would be really hot, these upper story areas would also be used for the family to eat and sleep in. So we go into the uh, main building, into the front door, and this, this featured like a sh another shrine area, which was reserved for pregnant women and uh, childcare. And I, I guess it was a way to show visitors how devout, the, devout they were about the religion. And it would also, uh, obviously feature a feasting area and this was uh, a, an opportunity for the estate owners to show their wealth to visitors as they entertained them um, so these would be quite elaborately decorated and built and now we take the Karnak uh, temple portal and we arrive at the Karnak temple um, and we arrive at this processional area and uh, the, the first area is called the Avenue of the Ram-Headed Sphinxes. And this was a large processional area before we went to the, the main uh, gate um, with these massive pylons with flags flying from them. And then to the inner court of the first gate. And again, obviously the, the goal would be to have metahumans dotted about that we could uh, learn some more information from. And there are a number of places to explore, such as Ramses III's temple. Um, and we go back to the main exhibit. And these are some of the characters that I've been working in and, and metahumans to hopefully bring in um, possible character for Takabuti's father um, as, as one of the high priests in the, in the temple. Now, Takabuti herself has been on something of an evolution. Um, way back in 2009, uh, first basic facial reconstruction was done as a model and unveiled at the museum. When I joined the project uh, at the start of my PhD, um, I, in the early weeks, I did a digital sketch of what a digital version of Takabuti might look like. And then it so happened in 2020 that Takabuti um, the, the mummy itself was in England and it had a CT scan done and the people, the researchers at FaceLab uh, in the John Moore's uh, Liverpool University 
we're able to use that data to do the most accurate reconstruction of Tagabuti's face. And one of the features of Tagabuti that was unusual for, for the time was she had this curly hair. Uh, most women in those days would have shaved their heads off and wore wigs, but Tagabuti seemed to be very proud of her hair. Even in death, her hair had been curled in style. So the uh, future studies that are going to happen, there's three main studies. The first study will be um, taking what we've built to date and doing a thematic analysis with uh, experts from the museum and experts from Ulster uh, to, to collect some uh, data on the, the UX. The second study will involve a wide consultation with the creative community, uh, industry and education. Um, because uh, like how are people approaching six degrees of freedom uh, storytelling? It's it's quite a difficult medium to to get right. And the re rationale for doing that study is in UX. Uh, my own perspective is not universal, so I want to do a wide um, consultation. And the rule of University of Ulster PhDs is always be recruiting. So if if anybody that's uh, creative out there that has worked on VR six degrees of freedom or three degrees of freedom and you want to contribute to that study, please email me or contact me at the uh, conference. And then the final study will be to take the data from study one and the data from study two and do an iterative update and hopefully develop that animated experience as well. And then do a thematic analysis with staff and students from the University of Ulster. And hopefully we should be able to highlight some improved guidelines uh, for around UX. Thank you for viewing this presentation. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Philip. That was really interesting. Um, hopefully, uh, we'll have enough time for uh, some questions in the end, uh, because I think the projects presented in this particular session are all sort of dealing with sort of designing narratives and projects and mm. um, interaction. So thank you very much. No problem. Um, thank immediately you. Um, following your presentation, is uh, a presentation titled um, Interactive Storytelling for Virtual Reality Medium by Real Walking Inside Virtual Story World. And um, we're joined here by Mohamed Reza Mazare, uh, who will talk us through his project. Mohamed Reza, hello. Hi. We can see you great. Um, yeah. And then Philip and I will step off the stage. Okay, thank you. And I had some problem with sharing the slides, so I provide you a video. Just let me share the video. Good thing, everyone. My name is Mohamed Reza Mazari, a PhD researcher at Staffordshire University. Although the title of my project is Interactive Storytelling for Virtual Reality Medium by Real Walking Inside Virtual Story World, I'm going to speak about the generic element that give us the possibility to design interactive VR movies. This generic element comes from the nature of virtual reality medium. Let's say that the storytelling relates to movement and the art of storytelling is the art of designing movements. It includes moving the object inside the story world as well as creating movement for the viewpoint which is mainly referred to design movement for the camera. And the reason that I emphasize on movement is that movement create duration. As soon as we feel duration, we make stories. And cinema is the art of moving picture, which an artist frames picture to convey dramatic contents. So, a filmmaker frame the movements and create an out of field and the dialectic between what a filmmaker shows and hides proceeds the story. In this case, the generic element for creation is the snapshots, screen 24 times per second, and montage is the tool that able a storyteller to make an expression that gives audiences an image of time. But immersion in a surrounded environment refuses the out of field. It is an immersive cinema. However, in virtual reality, 
The cinematographic consciousness generated by movements of camera is now replaced by the personal viewpoint of audiences who can observe wherever they want. Audiences' minds act like real world and they use their natural perception to follow the story. So, this medium demands a new convention of montage to express the duration because, in this case, movements are perceived by our inner feeling of duration. In my first practice, I examined this change in perception condition, which was about the feeling of duration in an unusual situation. You can read about this research and its findings on my research gate page and watch the movie using the link provided on my page at Beyond website. My main findings were that feeling of duration can be an indicator to measure the presence. While audiences immerse in a virtual story world, they refer to their inner feeling of duration to identify the known isomorphic dramatic movements. It means that a VR filmmaker could control the expressive image of time in audiences by designing movements. So, we can start to reconstitute new storytelling conventions by controlling the movement in space and time. However, my project enables audiences to walk freely around the movie scene and create their movements. It is a about a movie without camera, an open world storytelling for cinema. This type of interaction that I give to my audiences create wonder audiences. So my project question is how the actual body movement of audiences give them the free will to influence the story presented to them or in, in other words, which element can help the designer to design the storyboard for wonder audiences? The answer is the generic elements of designing interactive cinematic virtual reality, which is spatial temporal coordination. It indicates how audiences interpret the story based on their spatial temporal coordination and interact with the virtual world by their movements and on the other side how the designer gives audiences agency of wandering around different blocks of a space-time and impose aesthetic values the cinematographic narrative through relating these blocks together to make the whole of the story Currently, in this project, I'm working on designing a narrative structure that present concurrent timelines and allow audiences to change their line of the story by re-walking inside the virtual scene and touching some part of the scene, which I call them time gates. Inspiring from MC Escher Relativity, I'm working on a space with three different directions of gravity, in which audiences create their unique personal experience based on their spatial temporal coordination. So, I need to structure proper narrative patterns, which suitable for this space, 
give audiences compatible interaction possibilities to explore the story world while considering the technological aspect of designing the virtual space so could be experienced by wider audiences with their headsets from their home. Nevertheless, this project still is about designing the movement. So I suggest you watch this experimental 360 movie. Are you ready for a walk? Let's go. You will experience how movement and narrative engagement can prevent disorientation and find an idea about my approach to the problem of VR motion sickness and disorientation. I would be glad to discuss more the terms and topics of my research and investment on prototype and end product. Please contact me via hopping platform or the email address provided on my page at Beyond website. You can get more about my project on my YouTube channel and my ResearchGate page. Thank you for listening. There you go. You can hear me. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I just want to very quickly point out that all of the videos that you showed in your slides, the ones that were embedded, are also available online and they're quite interesting and worth watching. So please check out um, the poster exhibition um, section of the website where all of the links are available to view. Thank, thank you, you again for your presentation. Thank you. Um, so next up we have Christine Singer, who is presenting on Into the AR Metaverse, Child Co-Design for Cultural Exchange in the UK and China. And Christine is joining us from the uh, Story Features Cluster at Royal Holloway. Hello, Christine. Hello, Zatlina. Hi, everyone. Brilliant. Um, I'll just leave the stage and leave you to it then. Thank you. Okay, I hope that looks okay for everyone. Uh, so hello, um, I'm Christine Singer. I'm a children's immersive audience researcher um, at Story Futures. And today I will be presenting work in progress and sort of interim findings from Story Futures China, um, which is an R&D project that I'm currently working on and that focuses on child co-design for cultural exchange in the UK and China. Um, just to give you a brief um, overview on the project. Um, so Story Futures China is run by Story Futures um, at Royal Holloway, um, Brunel University, um, the National Gallery in London and a partner museum in Shanghai. Um, the aim of the project is to design a new immersive experience that enhances children's and families' experiences of art galleries and museums in both locations, and that at the same time stimulates an intercultural dialogue between the UK and China. So Story Futures, the National Gallery and Arcade, which is um, the production company on the project, are currently working with children aged 7 to 11 years old and their families um, to create this new experience. And um, the aim is to launch that in February 2020. Um, our anticipated outcomes are the development of a mobile AR app to use on location at the venues in London and Shanghai, as well as an at-home featured experience um, after a visit. Plus, Arcade are also designing a new game on Roblox. Um, some of you might know, some of you might not. Um, Roblox is an online gaming platform that's very popular um, at the moment with children of the age group that we are working with. And this game extends the narrative of the on-site experience in the gallery into a digital gaming um, environment. There you go, sorry. <laughs> so um, creating new technologies for children is not an easy task um, because at, as adults, we can't really rely on our own memories of our own childhoods um, as we create technologies that children will enjoy today and that also have our market. So um, for that reason, um, we are working with participatory design 
which is a methodology that is focused on engaging users in the design process. Um, closely related to our current methodological and conceptual approach is Alison Druin's cooperative inquiry, which is also known as co-design. So this is a concept that envisions adults and children working together as equal design partners in the creation of new technologies by using participatory research methods. Um, Druin has described four different roles that a child can have in a co-design process, that of a user, a tester, an informant and a design partner. And these roles differ from just observing to actively working with children. For example, as a user and a tester, children test new solutions but still have a passive role in the design process. But if they're an informant, children are able to give input in various stages of the design process. And if they're a design partner, they're considered an equal stakeholder of that process. But as we found uh, in this project, co-designing with children is not without challenges. Um, aside from ethical questions and issues of safeguarding, um, it's very important that the participation is meaningful and benefits um, the children. So we really want children to be equal design partners, but there are power structures of a complex project like this that usually place adults in control. And often these kind of power imbalances can be addressed through play for research methods that amplify children's ideas like drawing or crafting together. But, um, you know, the social distancing rules that we all had in place over the last year or so meant that we had very limited opportunities to engage with children in person. So we had, find, had to find ways around that. Um, so the research that my research that focuses just on the code design aspect of this project focuses on the question of how can children participate participate meaningfully in the design of a new augmented reality experience, which co-design methods are effective, especially when we consider remote research. How can that co-design process foster transnational exchanges between the UK and China? And how can co-design um, encourage children to learn about the arts, the paintings of the National Gallery and the natural world? Um, so just to give you an insight of what we've been doing um, over the past half a year or so, we've been working with different groups of children. First of all, we have a children's advisory group who regularly meets um, with the production company remotely. So we're using Zoom for that. Um, we're also running workshops with groups of primary school class to test ideas, concepts and prototypes with, with bigger numbers of children. We've been doing that remotely, but also recently had an in-person workshop, which was really nice. <laughs> Um, we've been running testing events at the National Gallery, as you can see in the photo. Um, and finally, we're also having remote workshops with children in um, China. And I'm going to explain a, a bit more about these different areas in a minute. Um, our workshops that we're doing with primary school children follow the double diamond design methodology and consist of four stages, um, discover, define, develop and deliver. So during our first workshop, we discovered the perspectives of children about art, nature and ecology. Session two was focused on defining the design opportunities for the immersive experience together with children. During session three and four, we developed the design concepts using draft prototypes. Um, and we are yet to enter stage four. So that's where we are at the moment. We are um, we will be delivering the final experience prototype and test it um, with children and parents. Um, there are just, these are really just provisional kind of findings because I'm kind of in the process of analyzing what we have done so far, very much work in progress. Um, key themes that emerge from our experience are that um, where children specifically had influence in the code design process where in the design of the central game character of both the onset experience and the Roblox game. Um, in the game mechanics of both experiences, which are based on clues and rewards, um, and the narrative structure of the game. And we also took a lot of methodological, methodological learnings away from this process, so what worked and what didn't work. Um, so first of all, it was key to engage children early on in the process, though they've been with us from the pitching event onwards. Um, we are also engaging with parents as the gatekeepers of apps or technologies that children use. Um, and we are, um, we've been experimenting with combining traditional co-design methods like drawings or um, story writing with working in a virtual game um, environment. And I'm going to come back to that a bit later. 
Um, there are also challenges like, you know, um, adult child power inequalities are still a central theme and problem because adult designers do have more power when it comes to making bigger decisions that are really related to marketing, usability, etc. And it's also not always easy to keep children engaged during remote workshops, especially if there's quieter ones um, in a group. But just to give you a little bit of an insight, I can't show too much of the experience itself because it's under development and you have to kind of treat it very conventionally, but I can show you what ideas have emerged from the children. Um, so here you can see um, we've done lots of drawings with them to generate ideas for the um, AR experience um, and also to seek their children's feedback on the latest developments of the designs. Um, here you can see children's drawings of what's called this Keeper of Paintings. The Keeper of Paintings is basically the main character in the on-site experience in the National Gallery, um, which children imagined when we just asked him, what do you think a Keeper of Paintings is? Um, like a wizard-like character or a fairy, someone with magical powers who lives in the National Gallery. And as we developed this idea through a little bit of creative story writing, we established with the children that the Keeper of Paintings is a mysterious character, is a little bit magical and a bit friendly, but also a little bit mean. And his job is, or her job is to protect uh, the paintings in the gallery. Um, so this is what the Keeper does in, in the game as he takes the children um, on a journey. Um, through these um, story writing and discussion sessions with the children, um, Arcade also decided to de develop an experience that is based on clues around paintings. Um, and um, the, and on rewards that the children get if they um, if they get a clue right. Um, we've tested a basic prototype of the experience with children and families in the National Gallery. Um, so um, we did like a walkthrough of the AR trial without the AR elements because they're still being developed, um, and then sought um, family uh, feedback from families and various elements like. We asked them how much they enjoyed the experience, both children and parents. We asked what's the ideal length. It looks like it's about 45 minutes. And we asked, you know, how do you like the clues? Um, you know, and as we can see here, parents thought the children had quite a lot of fun um, solving the clues. Now, at the same time, my colleague um, Lulu Yin is running similar work in China, which explores these same areas with Chinese children and their ideas around um, an enjoyable game in a museum. So here, here you can see how Chinese children imagine a keeper of paintings to look like, which is quite different from the wizard-like figures we've seen here in the UK. So uh, the theme that comes out of that is that it's more of a mystical creature with special powers. And finally, Arcade, our production company, are also creating a new game in Roblox, um, which will pick up the narrative and characters of the on-site experience. Um, like I said before, Roblox is a game platform that's very popular with children, which has recently even been described within some people in the children's media industry as a proto-metaverse. So something that's close to a metaverse and always on virtual space where children play games and are part of an extensive network um, of users at the same time. For us, Roblox acts as a so-called virtual sandbox game environment, which um, basically means it's a video game with a gameplay element that gives the player a great degree of creativity to, to complete tasks towards a certain goal within the game. So when we ran these remote workshops on Zoom, we invited children to enter the prototype environment in Roblox and have a play. Because play is fun for children and is also a key childhood communication practice. Um, so in a research setting, children's play actions can be embedded with a lot of meaning, more than verbal answers to questions um, can provide. So using a space where children like naturally like to spend their free time um, allowed us to explore naturally what children love about Roblox, the type of new game they would like to create, and their opinions of the design. And looking ahead, um, like I said, the experience will launch in February 2020. Um, so we are still running co-design sessions. Um, we are testing activities on site and remotely. And I'm currently working on theorizing these insights a little bit more uh, rigorously. Um, we also plan to have an exclusion testing session in the new year. And um, finally, once the experience launches, we will have we'll do lots of evaluations um, of how it's it's received um, among children and the families in London and in Shanghai. So there's lots of exciting activities um, ahead of us. And that's from me. Thanks so much for uh, listening.
Fantastic. Thank you very much. That looks like a really interesting and very complicated project. <laughs> I know. Um, and I really hope that you get to test it out and launch it properly. Um, Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Going forward. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much for your presentation, uh, Christine. Um, I'm so, now, aren't I? Yeah. Uh, yes, if you want, you can step off or leave the virtual stage. Um, so now we're joined by Laura Markova from the University of Loughborough, uh, speaking about virtual empathy and embodied transculturation in the investigative art project, The Machine to be Another. Um, I think it's really worth going into um, the Beyond website and checking out the videos for this one because they're quite interesting. Um, Laura, is Laura able to join us? Hi. Yes. Yeah. Hello. Good time uh, in Belfast. It's great, absolutely. And um, let's see if I will be able to. Yes, you're you're live in Belfast. <laughs> you're live from yes, Belfast. Yes, well, I managed to find a quiet room because there, the, it's a, such an interesting program, and so much is going on. So. Um, you should be. I can share. Perhaps if I leave, yeah, fantastic. We can see your screen. So that should be, yeah, apologies because I'm uh, so uh, yeah. immersed basically in the, in the other people's projects. So I thought, okay, finally I can return to this one. So yeah, thanks so much for the opportunity to present its fragments from an ongoing research. And somehow uh, my approach to study this project rather came from cultural studies, uh, not so much from creative technology and rather from media arts. Um, so basically I will walk you through the motivation to work on the project, a bit of the conceptual framework, and then a kind of description of this case study. And to a great extent, my uh, also motivation to participate in Beyond was rather to discover similar projects that are dealing with uh, virtual empathy. Um, so we could see uh, that somehow in uh, the context of the Syrian refugee crisis, uh, that the hype was in 2015, we experienced an emergence of VR documentaries that were somehow promising that we can walk in the shoes of others or become more culturally sensitive. And I think uh, to a certain extent that relates, of course, to media ethics. I mean, what does it mean that you can just, uh, you know, use an app and check what's happening in a refugee camp in Palestine? So um, it's rather a theoretical discussion. Uh, are we really able to use technology to become more cross-culturally sensitive? Or as Susan Zontag has written about uh, the Vietnam War, we're just regarding the pain of others. Aren't we turning someone's pain into a media spectacle? And at the same time, I was kind of interested in a broader range of artistic expressions, uh, not uh, exclusively VR experiences, but rather also um, multi-channel video installations like by Superflex that were also taking this uh, in issue and trying to generate a kind of uh, cross-cultural sensitivity as a somatic experience or at embodied, uh, as an embodied aesthetic experience. So uh, in this sense, I tried to understand the specific creative uh, approaches and aesthetic strategies and the creative technologies to, to achieve a kind of embodied transculturation. Um, the overall framework, I would say, on uh, transcultural imaginary, with all this concept of transculturality, and I insist not multiculturality, which is a, which is a different uh, notion, uh, could be related to some perspectives on empathic imagination and cosmopolitan ethics, as Yulia Kristeva has suggested that we can accommodate cultural difference by imagining ourselves uh, in the shoes of another person. Also, according to Michael Epstein, who is a Russian culturologist, transculturality can be understood as the diversity of having different identities, of being different not only from others, but also from your own self. And he reaches this kind of arguments in relation to Homi Baba's notion of third spaces or hybridity. And then also uh, in their very famous book, Remediation, Bolter and Gruzin wrote, suggested this notion of virtual empathy, that uh, through uh, embodying different interfaces, you can become uh, a different entity. 
So in a sense, I see a certain interconnection between all these perspectives. And if you go even further into uh, kind of theoretical dimensions on the concept of embodied transculturation, we could take into account the work of Maya Nadik, who suggests that transculturation can happen into non-verbal spaces or intermediate spaces. And this very specific case study, the machine to be another, which was quite popular a few years ago and on ongoing since then it's having different manifestations and um, uh, versions and kind of scenarios so it was designed by be another lab which is a quite international interdisciplinary team of artists and researchers engineers and uh, it's based on neuroscience experiments um, so they're translated into a open source uh, art project on the connection between identity embodiment and uh, empathy um, so it's released as an interactive performance installation. Uh, it's using immersive real-time head tracking, or it's a kind of video recording. So you're not entering a synthetic CGI-generated environment. So in this sense, um, some reflections on this project have been, but can we define it as a virtual reality? Or, okay, probably it's immersive, but it's not exactly VR. It's rather a closed-circuit video installation to a great extent. And the scenarios of interaction are probably the most popular one is gender swap scenario. So you see yourself in the body of someone from the uh, different gender or experiencing the stories of refugees and newcomers to Europe and the UK, and also understanding um, kind of impairment. Um, in terms of what we can define as creative innovation is basically the this whole in, uh, process of uh, translating the certain R&D into uh, creative practice or neuroscience research. And I, I, I don't have a background in neuroscience, so this is rather a superficial approach of um, just listing the, um, the experiment that the Be Another Lab have uh, employed in this work. So that's the rubber hand experiment, which is uh, quite popular by the Henry Harrison Group in Karolinska Institute on Stockholm. So they, they claim that if you see a rubber hand, and you don't see your own, but you experience the same motion, then you can identify with uh, this artificial limb. Sense of embodiment. Uh, so it's, um, if you repeat the very same motions in the virtual space and in physical space, so this corporeal and virtual actions coincide, then you can feel translated uh, in the virtual space. And virtual embodiment of dark skin body, that uh, it also goes along with uh, implicit association tests before and after the, the experiment that uh, claims that um, to a certain extent it generates uh, cross-cultural understanding or um, somehow um, embodiment in a, um, beyond a certain ethnic or cultural origin. And um, uh, probably you have heard about the machine to be another as it's been exhibited in a range of festivals and very different uh, place specific contexts. Um, so probably what's um, kind of interesting that uh, in 2016 it visited FACT Liverpool, which was um, in this context completely released as a learning environment with students. And I think uh, on Beyond website there is a link to the video where the kids are sharing some kind of fear from the technology and they say it's a weird experience to see yourself in a different skin. It's a bit scary, but uh, also kind of uh, uh, enriching experience. And also uh, it was exhibited in a different context in Somerset House uh, in London um, within the encampment installation by Good Chance Theatre, which is a theatre company that initially uh, created this kind of theater space uh, in the refugee camp in Calais, in the jungle, was a kind of um, very specific environment to allow um, um, the refugees to overcome their trauma and this traumatic experience of uh, overcoming war. And then it was translated uh, in, into the, uh, in the center of London, uh, so it can be experienced from uh, visitors. And my personal understanding uh, of the work, the way I experienced it was in, uh, in Barcelona, in the center of contemporary uh, culture, um, within the exhibition uh, Plus Humans. And somehow uh, my initial associations were that it very much resembles, if you remember this film, but Catherine Bigelow's Strange Days, 
as you put on the goggles and basically you you see all your reactions performed by another body um, which was uh, in her film that was basically the the, the main level of uh, virtuality uh, another impression from the work was that it involves a level of telepresence or rather a dual sensation of being both in a physical and a virtual space so you don't really uh, forget your own corporeality, but you're exhibiting, you're somehow inhabiting both spaces, a kind of third space between the physical and uh, the virtual environment. And then um, I was part of the, the so-called gender swap scenario, which does not allow you so much to uh, experience gender in terms of performativity, but somehow as a kind of post-gender equality. So uh, as if... Um, it erases gender, so it's uh, it's a quite quite interesting. That, that's why I related to this concept of Donna Haraway, the cyborg, that it's kind of uh, overcoming any kind of binary uh, distinction between male and female. And in this sense, my final remarks are um, through analyzing the different neuroscience experiments and uh, uh, the approaches and the different scenarios that certainly uh, the work is using subjective camera view as an empathetic tool um, to, to experience um, uh, someone else's uh, uh, life beyond gender, beyond racial, ethnic, or cultural dif differences. Uh, this also understanding of sensory motor destabilization uh, somehow provokes imaginary extension in someone else's uh, um, experiences. And it's also... Uh, I would not say that you're completely translated in a different environment, but you indeed realize that you can exist in different versions that uh, conceptually resemble the transcultural model. And probably if there is some kind of subversive uh, function, this uh, artwork or this investigative art project, is that it's somehow destabilizing all these discursively reproduced social categories as like self, father, mind, body, organism, machine, male, female, so um, in, in this sense, we can also understand uh, Haraway's uh, theory probably is synonymous to the transcultural one. And as I said, uh, my intention to, to participate in Beyond was to, to great extent to experience similar projects. For instance, Limbo, that it's um, showed right now in the immersive ar arcade uh, showcase yesterday and today. And yeah, of course, I'm looking for further suggestions and uh, opportunities to to go further into this research and rather to translate this kind of quite theoretical framework into into more applied uh, dimensions. Okay. So thank you. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Uh, can I just ask that uh, you stay on on the stage? So just stop the sharing slides, uh, but stay. Yes. Don't fly off. So I say I, I apologize. I have to quick leave or not? Not leave, but uh, stop sharing. Or yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and then <laughs> we can also be joined by the rest of the presenters. So Christine. Philip and Mohamed Reza, if you can join us online very quickly for a few questions and further discussion. Hi, Philip. Hi, Christine. Hi. And then hopefully Mohamed Reza will be also able to join us. Um, but what I'm interested in is that all of your presentations so far in some way are reflecting on either a specific project or the development or the experience of a specific project or just the relationship of being into that world, into the virtual reality world, and how do we relate to narrative construction in that world? So um, my understanding is that some of your projects are still in development. Yeah. Um, so I, and are you able to share any feedback that you've received or is it top secret? No, mine is still in development, so still secret. So uh, the, the, you know, the information that I gave you in the presentation is that the only thing that I can say about a project right now. Mm -hmm. And do you, so just because also a lot of the um, projects are touching on working with audiences from different nationalities or different age groups, do you ever find that their experience of the project 
is in some way defined by that different mindset that they have. There may be children or adults or men or women. And do you think that this is a response to the the relationship with the technology or the actual narrative? For my project, in my first practice, I participated people from different age and uh, you know, amazingly, the older people was you know where they were very easy to communicate with virtual environment and you know they identify themselves and the virtual environment better than the youngest people. You know, then they then the audiences, you know, immersed in an unusual place. You know, I'm working actually on this that the they start to find a way to identify themselves and identify the environment which immerse in. So I observed that the older audiences do it better. Yeah. Interesting. Um, is this the case with other uh, thoughts? Um, I think, um, so with children, sometimes I guess we can't predict how they appropriate technology um, and sometimes are very quick to pick up and say it an environment like Roblox, whereas the adults are kind of still figuring it out. <laughs> so I think they're very savvy um, and often, you know, use a playful approach to engaging with um, technology that, you know, maybe gets lost as you get older. I don't know, but I guess there's still this kind of, we are just exploring and um, coming to um, a new technology with, with just lots of ideas and what you could do with it. And um, it's been really amazing just seeing um, their ideas. But yeah, I think definitely a more playful approach. Um, and um, yeah, like often, often unpredictable of what, <laughs> you know, what they do. They might just take a phone and run off in the National Gallery and, um, you know, figure it out, I think. Um, maybe less self-conscious what can happen. And I have, I, I just you know, explained this on known experience with VR users. So this age help for the known experience of VR users, being older results in better immersion. Um, I guess for my project, I'm still in a testing phase in that I have to have uh, museum experts and VR experts go through it first to check for authenticity of the build because I'm trying to recreate historical places, etc. Um, but ultimately, um, because it's going to be in a museum, um, they have like a school program. So children will be involved at some stage and that will be tested later down the line. But one, one of the issues I have with VR with children is, is that obviously manufacturers haven't built headsets specifically for children. Um, so there are user experience issues there. I suppose the closest that would have come so far would be PlayStation VR, um, which is actually one of the most comfortable headsets on the market, but it is a tethered headset. So again, it would be nice to, you know, uh, get headsets out there that weren't tethered, that were specifically manufactured for smaller children, uh, for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so our project works with augmented reality for the same reason. So we're not using mm -hmm. headsets. Yeah. So that's an actual physical barrier then um, when working with children and sort of marketing to children. That's an actual industry niche, perhaps. Maybe this group yeah. can market this. Um, and, and, and Laura, did you find um, that in your research, in your sort of reflection on your on, on this project, did you find that perhaps experiences and reactions to this gender swap that you were sort of talking about, do you find that this is motivated by some kind of social or cultural mindsets that are pre-existing or just curiosity? Well, we are in a sense through analyzing the whole project because I reflect on it externally and not, not prior, part of the artistic team. Uh, there is this such kind of tension between is it discursively constructed, the meaning of the project, is it narratively based, or it's rather indeed some, some kind of sensory level that you can just go beyond uh, any narrative construction. And um, I don't know, maybe maybe the perception is really culturally specific, uh, 
um, it, it, it just requires audience research. And in the gender swap scenario, I mean, probably if you come from a background of uh, reading the gender as a social construction, you can very uh, easily, you know, de deconstruct or just interpret the whole experience as such. But uh, that's also very subjective as an approach. So I'm, I'm not sure that I can reach any kind of... Sorry, Laura, you cut off, like, literally, like, the last sentence you were cut off. <laughs> Yeah. Ah, okay. I'm uh, because I think so. So many people are on the network here. So I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, um, yeah. But, but I'll just repeat that I, I guess it's a very much a subjective experience and uh, related to yeah, to probably to really to some kind of social construction. Yeah. I'm not sure if if I'm again on <laughs> online. Mm -hmm. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. We we heard you second time round. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, fantastic. So um, we are reaching so, towards the end of the session, but I thank you very much for these four fantastic presentations. They were really interesting in the way that they offer different views of how people associate of different ages, different cultural backgrounds, and also it's narratives of different types. So perhaps people relate differently to a historical narrative as opposed to a gender swap or, or a, you know, um, a different type of narrative. Um, in terms of the uh, actual posters, I very strongly urge the audiences to log in and view all of the video materials. They really are fantastic. Uh, thank you very much to all of the speakers and please rejoin us for the third and final session at four o'clock this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.